Hamilton is currently the AGO Artist in Residence and presented the um, work as part of Nuit Blanche this past Saturday that delved, I don't want to preempt too much what uh, Amy's going to talk about, delved into the archive, uh, AGO archives in relation to performance um, through a key period of time and the gaps in, in the archive and how to engage with the archive. So please welcome Amy Henderson. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to try to talk about what I understand to be my choreographic practice kind of uh, from a conceptual point of view and then go into a couple of projects. Um, and I want to do that mostly because um, for me choreography is something that a set of tools that I've been um, thinking of as what I work with and I imagine that there's a lot of different um, connotations that the word choreography has. And as Christoph um, sort of alluded to, uh, um, an often a kind of collapse of dancing and choreography, um, which I really actively try to um, keep uh, in attention with each other. Um, I love dancing. I think dancing is crucial um, for many reasons, but choreography is not in my understanding of what I do, um, dancing only. It's, it's a set of tools to activate relations in time and space. And that can look like many things, including dances. So, so I, um, I make choreographic work that concerns itself with action in time and space. And I try to elaborate con conceptual structures that are co-authored uh, in collaborative um, um, working arenas um, where a group of people can get to the business of working really practically on concepts. So I, I am, um, think of embodiment as being crucial to what I do, although I think it's, um, it would be a misnomer to say that embodiment always um, is, is working um, in choreography. I think choreography can also be uh, have nothing to do with bodies potentially, but in, in my work, um, being in a particular space and time and doing that with one's body is, is quite key. Um, so working on these concepts and getting, getting to how to work on them as, as a kind of, um, um, I talk a lot about how to do them, how to do concepts um, as quickly as possible so that instead of talking about the what um, in a kind of idea uh, frame, it's really thinking of how to activate ideas and how to move ideas. And this is where thinking of choreography as movement is really, really um, useful. Um, so if, if choreography or choreographic work is about action in time and space, then there's two key tools that I use um, in creating choreographies. One is score, score making, which some people may um, associate with music, um, but, uh, and that's a really useful um, connotation. Um, I think of scores as a set of agreements that a group of people have predetermined that then can be something that can orchestrate an activity uh, in real time. And these scores can be extremely simple, like um, one of my last works, uh, Voyager for Toronto Dance Theatre, the score was move continuously for one hour and don't stop moving and don't repeat. And at the end of an hour, stop. And nine dancers practiced that, got better at doing that, figured out what that meant to them. But for all intents and purposes, the, the base score didn't change. It was always move continuously for an hour, don't repeat, don't go back on yourself. Um, and don't stop moving. And then it can be, these things can also be quite elaborate with many, many um, indications in time and in space about who is doing what, and where, and why. Um, and those parameters are very specific to each project. And the creation of those parameters is what I think of as being the practice that I do with other people. So I start with an idea that I bring to a group, but I don't I don't know how it's going to work, and I figure out the rules and the, the strategies, most often in collaboration with other people. 
A score creates parameters that allow for repetition and practice. For me, choreographic practice is about going over again, being able to do again. So what are the what are the base agreements that are necessary to allow for us to go back again and try something once more? So in that, in that way, I think it, I really um, separate myself from a, a, a purely improvisatory practice. Um, while improv is crucial to the ways people behave in these pieces, it's important that there's enough that we know together collectively to be able to return to um, whatever the work is and do it again and try to deepen it, maybe perform it more than once if we're lucky, um, take it to new spaces and understand what changes when you move it from space to space. So if a score is a set of predetermined agreements, then performance is the negotiation of those agreements in time. Exposing this decision-making process is the performance. People are working on something in public. Its outcome may be somewhat indeterminate, but it is readable as people working on something. The negotiation is transparent, yet with multiple readings and or meanings. Of course, failure is always possible. If score and performance are crucial for choreography, then choreography is these two things working together. What is decided in advance, the score, and what happens in the moment, the writing of event in time and place. So that the choreography is actually not written until it's in negotiation in a public arena of performance. With my group <coughs> projects, each performer works through the score from their own position. This position has to do with their experience, their training, um, their way into the project, their relationship with me and my work, um, maybe what they have done most recently, their injuries, their own personal interests. The collectivity of these actions, each person in the score for themselves side by side, creates composition. So I'm not generally um, interested in composition as the first um, way into making a work, but creating tasks that can render composition visible through the performance of, of these works. I feel like a bit of a one-trick pony. All my projects concern themselves with questions of how a group can temporarily and temporally exist together, survive and transform. They also take up spatializing and tuning perception so that the movement of one's senses, both performers and audience, is part of the emerging composition. This is only trackable for yourself. So if choreography is also the tuning of perception, then choreography is happening in the micro-perceptible level as well. These proposals hold space to resist the binary of group and individual, asking how can we be together and still be ourselves. And this, um, I want to speak um, about uh, my work, what we were saying, which was a group work created in 2003, just to kind of bring some of these more conceptual ideas about choreography um, to land them in a, in a specific project. But does anybody have any questions before we go forward? Score, performance, choreography? Yeah? I wonder how recent or practice the rehearsal aspect of it. It's all of it. Rehearsal is, for me, rehearsal's it. Like so everything happens in rehearsal. <coughs> but rehearsal can look like many things. Like this could be, this is rehearsal. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I'm, uh, to be really specific, um, I rent studio spaces and groups of people start to get together and work. And at the beginning that often is a conversation that then as quickly as possible, we're trying to find ways to move the conversation but without making a huge leap between a discursive practice and a, and, a, and a moving practice so that it's more of a continuum. I, I really try not to make a, a break between like this is the talking about what we're gonna do and then this is the doing of the thing, but that you can talk and do and that there's different registers of how you articulate a work as you create it. 
but I, I love rehearsal. I love working. That, uh, dancing and choreography for me is really about labor. Okay, this is my first PowerPoint presentation. Also very proud. <sighs> so what we were saying uh, was created in um, 2013. It's a group of um, about 12 collaborators. And it explores the potential of shared improvisatory speech acts. So we started with the improbable question, is it possible for us to speak all together without knowing what we're going to say next, um, while listening and talking at the same time, and trying to be in perfect choral unison? Pretty much. Pretty, pretty ridiculous, but also um, when I talk about this idea of a score and a set of agreements, that was the base agreement that we were in, was that we were going to try to accomplish shared improvisatory choral speech. Um, I have this quote um, from a book called The Art of Listening, which uh, has been a little bit of a touchstone for me for several years. Listening has been a crucial part of the way that I understand performing and performance. Listening as the first action. And listening as a whole body um, experience. Listening as expanded sense. Uh, in, in part to reject um, as much as possible the kind of ocular centrism of watching especially dance and theatrical works in a, in a, in a kind of like theatrical frame. Um, and in general, uh, in dance, the kind of reliance on the eyes as a way of understanding and making meaning, both in learning it, practicing it, and watching it. Um, here, the binary listening and utterance, as well as sound and sense, our sidestep to imagine that we might speak and listen simultaneously while trying to co-author meaning and experience in real time. Making strange sounds becomes communicable in new and invented manners. So I'm really interested in where sense making kind of tips over into sound making and, and back again without, without uh, creating hierarchies or um, uh, imagining that it might be possible to say something that we don't know how to say yet. So bro broadening the lens of what is possible to be a, a tool of communication. And I'll just show you. Um, so this, I guess this uh, quote is a positions listening as the first act and one of reception and um, openness to what one might witness if in a receiver position. And then how to transmit without losing that, that sense of being a receiver. We made this little uh, video, and I think it kind of gets at what we're doing by, by visualizing. Um, as well with the help of uh, a video um, artist, Lee Henderson, uh, trying to spatialize language in the way that we're hearing it and imagining it. It's really hard to make documentation of this work, so this was one of our attempts to get at how it operates. What do you think he's over Well, I think it's important that it's important to understand people. When you hear it on a recorded device, it's kind of like, it doesn't resonate in that same way. It's kind of like, it's lost in the space. We're in the sound though. I don't know if I understand the question actually. Thank <laughs> you. 
So that was just a um, <coughs> early early days in our process where we were trying to figure out ways of of, um, of pitching the work and and telling people about it and struggling with a work that was so decentralized that it was really hard to understand how to bring it back together again to frame it as a, a promotional video. So this idea of trying to um, use animation to to make it operate in in the register of, of a flat um, 2D uh, moving image um, maybe speaks to how I'm always trying to transduce um, tools between mediums. So I, I borrowed a lot of a lot a lot of language from sound art and music uh, in order to understand what I think I'm doing in choreography. So I wouldn't ever refer to what I'm doing as interdisciplinary. I really think of it as choreographic. But it's very, very helpful to appropriate language and tools from other forms. With all of the projects that I make, the, um, the staging is, can't be removed from the, the very concept of the work. Um, the, the piece, what we were saying, drew heavily on Bruno Latour's actor network theory as a way of understanding how we were working in space. Um, this idea of a network where everything is connected to everything and any change creates change in the whole system was useful in, in de deciding how to use the whole stage space, the, the, the space of the audience and the elements that we were manipulating, sound gear and chairs and our own bodies and ideas and sounds, to make a kind of flat understanding of all of those elements and to understand them in this, in this network where everything is proximal. If you're very close, you're in a kind of um, local broadcast situation and if something's happening on the other side of the room, you imagine that it's local for someone else. So it's this um, ever expanding kind of network of connections. You can see this in, um, in this uh, overhead drawing by the designer and uh, visual artist Sherry Hay, who works on the project. And here she sets out the scheme for the seating in um, the Montreal venue where we performed. And this uh, arrangement of, of chairs, it follows a network of two, two empty chairs to three um, people chairs. Uh, the chairs are facing multiple directions. There's no front. Uh, the sound equipment is in, entirely mobile. It's a, a set of small amplifiers with uh, microphones and cables attached. The network enables a work that operates as proximal as everywhere. There's an inability to frame, which differently privileges senses other than sight to construct readings and reconstruct readings. It's conversational and it's moving in all directions. It can be incredibly frustrating if you're trying to make a, a kind of overarching understanding of the work. I think it can be incredibly exciting if you claim your own um, authorship of your own seeing as you're inside of it and your own hearing. The composition is authored by each spectator. It's specific to their engagement and literal position in the room, what emerges, what it's about, how it, how it um, unfolds in time. The tools are simple and slightly misused. Chairs, microphones, even conversation is recognizable and repurposed. So I'm quite interested in badly using um, recognizable tools. So pretty lo-fi, um, pretty readable as things we understand to be part of everyday life, and then just slightly altered from whatever usage they normally afford. So chairs here become very lively as our stage space, as well as the space of the audience. And I have a little um, video. This is uh, uh, the piece last spring at Nottingham Contemporary. So 
So this thing was about a year and a half into the piece's life. And we were performing in a gallery, which is a, an interesting kind of shift of context for this work, depends on where we're showing it, how it's read. This was a dance festival um, with a performance in a gallery. So you'll notice that people start dancing and I'm proposing that we don't make a, a huge leap between talking and dancing to propose that we might just be able to move between those registers and still be communicating and sharing sensation in, in both um, modes of, of um, working. If listening is the main action that everyone's engaged with listening is an invitation to everyone, both performer and spectator, to activate space, to renegotiate ocular centrism, and as an ethical stance that listens first before adding information. Sound goes everywhere, but also comes from somewhere. Its production is spatial, creating different zones of comprehension and sensation. <coughs> so in this video, where there's one um, video machine like up in the on the balcony 
the sound um, is really hard to understand as it actually happens in the performance, which is that it's completely spatial. And where you are sitting and what you hear, what you can perceive in all manners of listening with your eyes, with your ears, with your body, um, is very specific and very local to your orientation in the room. And you can see how people, uh, um, it's very micro, but all the spectators are making small movements as they track different parts of the performance around them. Are there any questions so far? Uh, did the uh, spectators know that some people were dancers when they arrived, or how was that negotiated? No, the only thing that they that they know is that this is a, a, on a wall didactic and a list of all the people that made the performance, but that includes some people that are not even with us when we're traveling. We also engage two <coughs> local performers everywhere we, that we go, so there's a bit of slippage around recognition and sometimes in a place those people will be more noticeably potential performers than we are, but then those people don't do much until very, very late in the performance. So I'm trying to, without being too much of a brat, really trying to scratch um, on that question of who is a performer, what does it mean to perform, how, how do I activate my own presence without feeling like somebody's making me participate. I hate participation in performances. It's not what I came to do. So. I think this works or like ride that line, but really there's no particular way to be with it. So I'm hoping it doesn't make everybody feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Makes some people feel uncomfortable. Other questions? So recently, if listening was something that I was really engaged with, uh, for the last few years. More recently, I've turned um, my attention to reading. I've, I'm very, very taken with uh, ubiquitous modes of um, engaging with materials that could be shared by both performers and audience. So listening for me was um, really early on in my practice. I, I sort of felt, and now I, I think a bit naively, um, imagined that music was something that operated um, through listening for both musician and audience. And I was I tried to map that onto an engagement with a dance practice. What what are ways that we can be participating in the same sensorial and perceptive act as both spectator and and audience? And um, so thinking of this uh, more recently, I've been working on writing and reading as performative gestures um, through a series of projects um, where experimenting with collective writing and reading as performative um, is a strategy for placing performer and spectator in shared modes of engaging with the work, creating porousness between writer and reader, performer and spectator. The first um, an ongoing project called How to Work a Performance Encyclopedia. The score is a group of people get together for a, a predetermined amount of time. They have regular office hours. They follow, a, a, they kind of borrow from the, a rehearsal a way of working where you meet in one space and time and you work for a certain number of hours and then you come back the next day. So we write an encyclopedia in a set amount of time using our own experience without researching. And then at the end of that amount of time, we publish the encyclopedia for the time it takes to read almost the entire book. We invite uh, a public to come read it with us. And as soon as that reading is finished, the book goes out of print. So this is a project that tries to imagine a performance in the shape of a book. We've made, uh, I think now, six encyclopedias. We always start from scratch. Um, and so reading and writing as the people who initiate the project 
become um, modes of engagement that we move between, but we also invite uh, the spectator to read alongside us. Um, it's also thinking choreography as, as a book. Choreography actually is a, a, a word that has writing embedded in it as an idea. So for me, it's an extension to think of reading and writing as choreographic practice. Um, has been a really um, fruitful experience. Eight Days of Gathering of Choreographers is a, for the most part, a peer-to-peer um, skill sharing exchange project with no production um, uh, at the end of it. It's a, a group of choreographers from across Canada get together and spend eight days um, mostly cooking and eating together. But we also have developed this reading practice where people bring um, books and we, we read in the same space and time together. So this is another way that I've, I've been thinking about how people can be doing individual um, things, authoring their own experience in time alongside of other people. <coughs> And then most recently, this is a, a piece that's just wrapping up at the AGO. It's called Rehearsal Performance. And to just very briefly describe what I've been working on at the AGO, I, I got invited to be the artist in residence and was quite confounded by the invitation as a person who makes performances because I, I had very little idea what the AGO's history of, of exhibiting performances was. And I didn't totally understand what I was coming into as a space that seemed to be interested in my practice, but hadn't, at, at least what had been available to me as information, hadn't demonstrated a public um, uh, institutional identity that included performance. So I made a proposal back to them to investigate their archives and to look for any scrap of liveness in um, a history that I, I started kind of arbitrarily in 1965 with an event that was one of the biggest performance events that is documented at the AGO. It was a, a happening that was staged by one of the one of the um, fundraising committees, and I tracked with the assistance of some re researchers. I tracked a chronology of about 700 performance events between 1965 and the present. And then with that list as my um, main guide, I looked at the archive for um, specifically for experimental choreographic acts made by women choreographers um, and other associated performances between 1977 and 1981, which is a time period where um, the AGO reflected what was going on in Toronto in terms of a a very um, vibrant um, scene where performance was starting to become one of the modes that people were using to make um, quite radical work. And I, I copied the archive, all of the archival materials that I thought were interesting for whatever reason. I was following my intuition and I was also working really quickly because it was a very short time period that I was there. And I, in copying, so I, I made photographs of everything that was of interest to me in the archive, and in copying that archive, I understood that I was taking it back into, into circulation. And I started to read it in public. So my, my work was a rehearsal process that happened in public at the AGO. The main mode um, for that project was to read the archive and to describe what I was finding in the archive as a performative gesture but as rehearsal so that it remained unfinished. And so this is an image of one of the performers I was working with um, looking at materials on the floor. The other really crucial operation with this project was to topple the pictorial plane um, of the galleries, like sort of main site for experiencing information and put that onto the plane of the body. So all of the documents that, that we were working with were on the floor. And so the experience for me of a, of a body down on the floor of the document becomes a kind of dancing, a reading of a score 
in space and time. So um, we went on with this project. We did five public rehearsals, and that culminated in a 12-hour durational rehearsal for New Launch last Saturday, um, which engaged with about 12 performances over the course of 12 hours. And what we tried to do was to <coughs> use the scraps of information that I found in a, a very institutional archive. There's, not, there's no artwork in this archive. It's all the peripheral documentation about how artworks appear um, in the ongoing kind of day-to-day -day at the AGO. Um, work orders, contracts, um, requests for moving these chairs to this room and rehearsal schedules and things like that. Um, and some images, some images taken by AGO staff photographers. And then I interviewed about 20 artists. So I collided and, and, and tried to treat as archival and or non-archival um, anecdotal information from artists together with peripheral documentation on their performances at the AGO and use those materials to bring the idea of these performances into performance. So I don't see it as a, re a reenactment project, but rather um, a project that asks what's the very least we need to bring a performance back to performanceness. So the naming of these performances and the naming of these artists in public became a kind of a performative gesture um, and uh, many, many of those artists came, so it also became an encounter with their own history. A lot of the performances they didn't remember, so, um, and there was no documentation of them, so it, it becomes, it's like on the edge of fantasy at the same time as it's a, a rehearsal. So that's what I've just, um, just finished up with. Questions? I love, 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 love these. Um, I, I, I brought them to you because um, I think they're scores. They're a kind of score. Maybe a score that an artist has with herself about what her work means in a given moment. Um, I think uh, Yvonne Rayner made a, a really important gesture when she wrote the No Manifesto, one that was strong enough for her to talk back to and for other choreographers to speak back to as time went on. Um, most importantly, they really uh, highlight choreography as dialogic. I think that choreography is an inherently conversational medium, and this set of, of writings really demonstrates that for me. When one when, when art artist wrote herself a set of rules, she reconsidered them several decades later, and then a series of, uh, a new generation of artists, these are some of my colleagues, Andrea Bojic um, and, uh, and Manta Ingertsen and Bruno Pierre, um, writing back to her being in conversation with Yvonne Reina. I also think it's quite crucial that I identify it with yes and maybe quite a bit more than with no. And I, I think that's one of the, the questions that that is for you is what is what resistance or rejection does for your practice and what radical inclusion does. Saying yes over and over and over again is a very different action than saying no. Saying maybe is a very different action than saying either yes or no. And to me, they're quite. It's it's a it's a really simple set of engagements by this this range of artists that I think provide um, a, a way to identify yourself to one or more of them. I really really go straight for the maybe and the yes, maybe second, and the no is less interesting to me. Although I do really appreciate the Avon Rainer's manifesto we considered her talking back to herself, disagreeing with herself, realizing that she was way, way too 
um, idealistic or ideological. What's just impossible to take on as a maker? That she doesn't even understand herself. <laughs> Quite tremendous. Um, so that's, yeah, so that's why I, I brought those. Andrea Meta and Bruno are all choreographers working in the European um, choreographic scene, which is quite lively. Um, and it's very interesting that they, that this uh, group of artists are often taking up um, questions that were raised by the American postmodernists. So that's uh, um, something that I was thinking a lot about when I was working at the AGO and revisiting a history that I knew very little about that happened in my own city in context. And at the same time, I know probably way more than I should know about what was going on in New York in 1965. So placing oneself in relationship to different <coughs> histories, choreography as being iterative, but not having the same sorts of writing traditions as exist in the visual arts, um, make it a, a pretty slippery feel to work in to know kind of what you're in relationship with at any given moment. Should we go out and uh, do some dancing? <laughs>
is uh, we tend to ask questions when we're answering questions. It's a thing that people do. If you ask a question, then this person's going to leave. So no problem. <coughs> so you have to follow the rules. And even if this person didn't mean to ask you a question, clear? You answer one question and you ask one question. And as soon as you get asked a second question, you leave. You come to answer a question. Right? Figure it out as well. Do you get nervous talking in front of a big crowd? I do. And I tend to overcompensate by being more sure of myself than I actually am. <coughs> Do you think it's important to look like you know what you're doing? odd that there's a telephone next to a piano in this room? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
would chuck wood chuck all the wood he could chuck if a wood chuck could chuck wood. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
sort of job did you do during the once and turn orange, so never do that again. Um, how many alarms does it take, does it take? Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.